everyone. Okay, hopefully chat working on OBS. Yes? Oh, I should have my second monitor on. Give me one second. Here we go. We are streaming a little bit earlier earlier today than we normally would. What is going on? Good thing I started early. There we go. Yay, okay, there it is. Like chat was totally empty and I was like, that doesn't make sense. Hello everyone. I think there must be I wonder how long the delay is. It shouldn't be that long. But I guess it is. Yes, it is. So we have a we have a bunch of things to talk about today. Uh, not really sure where to start in terms of in terms of stuff, uh, but I guess I'll just I'll just begin by saying hello, everyone. Welcome. Hopefully you've been having a good Friday so far. Uh, anything fun, exciting going on in your life? All right, let me just I'm just gonna little pop pop jet. Yeah, there we go. Boop. Boop. Okay. Also, let me know. I think my voice should be at a good level, but if it's not, also definitely let me know. I'm not like in the center of the screen. I don't know if that changed anything. The light is like weird, right? See, if I do this, the lighting. Uh, how can I improve this scenario? Well, it's like that's not blocking as much of the uh, light I think maybe it maybe it is I don't know I feel like my eyelashes look weird I don't know I don't know ah, I need to stop like I feel like this one is like not not blending I need to just like stop messing with stuff I will do that until the end of time all right, well, welcome Connor, welcome Clear Blue, welcome Samantha, welcome Salem, welcome ABSP, welcome KE Miller, welcome Happy Luck, welcome Nick Reed, welcome Spencer, and Robin, and Deliria, and a bad cat <laughs> with extra D's and extra T's. That's great. That's a perfect name. Ooh, finished a 10 hour shift. I'm ready to, <laughs> I'm so down to relax. Oh my god, I bet. 10 hours. That's, that's a long one for sure. Ooh, greetings from Germany. Mm, very fancy. Hopefully the weather is good in Germany. I don't, I don't know. What is it like there this time of year? Mmm, oh, Euro soccer. Italy winning 3-0 against Turkey. I'm a humongous soccer fan. I usually get really into the World Cup when the World Cup happens. I'm definitely big into that. Uh, but otherwise I forget it exists in... <laughs> However many other years are between <laughs> are between World Cups and Olympics and such like. All right, so before we get into things, I guess just some some basic information is that this is an 18 plus only live stream. So if you are not at least 18, please don't be here. This is not not a chat for you. That is for my safety, your safety, everyone's safety. Mixing minors kink education with adults all in the same space very directly like that uh, not a great idea so just you know come back when you're 18 it's not because i think you're stupid or incapable of learning or you don't know what you want it's just safety safety reasons safety first always and this is an interactive q a so if you are at least 18 then you can participate in our q a you guys ask questions and i answer them and that could be anything that could be kink stuff, poly stuff, asexuality stuff, non-monogamous relationship stuff, do I like anime, <laughs> random, what's your favorite color, like sort of question, just like whatever it is you guys want to talk about. Uh, I find that sometimes we do tend to go in a direction, so like sometimes in streams we'll spend a lot of time talking about asexuality stuff or poly stuff or BDSM, totally whatever you guys want to. I have a few things before we get into answering questions that I want to mention real quick. Uh, I feel like my voice volume a tinge. Um, so 
I have a couple of things I want to mention first before we get into answering questions. Great opportunity to drive by right there, motorcycle. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, so I have one big announcement, which is something I've actually I've known for a while, but I have not talked about it yet is I'm going to pop a link in the chat for you guys. And it's also at the top of the box down below that you can, you can check out, but I am actually going to be teaching at an event next Friday already. I can't believe it. Time just flies. But next Friday, June 18th to 20th, there is an online conference that is from SELF, which is the Southeast Leather Fest. It's called Mayhem. And it looks like it's going to be a really good lineup. You can check it out. I'm going to be teaching a class there. Uh, and it should be a fun time. I have really been impressed with all of the educational stuff I've done for like online conferences so far. I've done Colorado Leather Fest and I've also done Thrive, which was a mental health BDSM conference. And they've all been really, really good. I have no reason to believe the Southeast Leather Fest would be any different in this case, their mayhem event. Uh, and yeah, they just, just click to get your mayhem, tic mayhem tickets. Uh, and it does, uh, it does, I think, I think the minimum is $20, I want to say. And you have until the 16th at midnight, which I assume would be East Coast time in order to get a ticket. So there you go. That's that. All right. Uh, all right, so that being said, I'll talk about that like more at the end of the chat, just in case, or end of the stream, in case like people come in later and they don't get to hear this part of the part of the stream. But that's really like the big like big announcement I wanted to make sure to get to. So yeah, let's uh, let's get into talking and answering some questions. Oh, um, Bandit I actually have a Bandit update for you guys. So if you guys were here last week, you may have heard that Bandit her her leg and she was limping around and I had to wait to take her to the vet. She finally got to go to the vet on Monday. It was like, Monday was crazy. I'm not going to get into the details about it, but just know that Monday was like very hectic. That's why I streamed on Tuesday instead of Monday. It's just, it's been an unusual week, but she got to go to the vet and they did x-rays and an exam and a bunch of stuff. It took a really long time. And it looks like she won't need surgery, probably. They have her on a course of medication, and then, like, after two weeks, they're going to, like, reevaluate and see if she's, like, kind of recovering on her own or if she would need surgery. So I'm not sure what's going on with that yet, but she at least didn't immediately need surgery, which I would prefer because anytime you have to put a small dog under anesthesia, it's not a good time. It's very stress-inducing. It's, it's a... Um, it's not like, I don't know how to quantify how risky it is, but if you can avoid it, you want to avoid it. So Bandit, otherwise, she is like snoozing. She has her face wedged between the window and her bed like this. She's like, <laughs> she looks very pouty. I have not been able to take her on a walk, but I think starting tomorrow, I should be able to take her on like shorter little like five, 10 minute long walks because they don't want her to like be like putting too much pressure on like her leg or overdoing it because she is trying to heal still, though not that Bandit knows that. <laughs> She's just like, why do I have to stay outside? Mm, I'm so upset. She's very, very upset about having to stay inside, but uh, she does get to go outside for like little periods of time, but not anything compared to what we used to do before she injured her leg. So I am trying to make sure she, she stays entertained and gets to enjoy outside and, you know, maybe less than doing 45 minute walks like what we did before. So <sighs> band of life. So hard, but otherwise she's like, she's good. I groomed her for the first time on my own. Like I don't I brush her like regularly and I do stuff like that, but I like actually like, cut her fur because I was gonna she's supposed to go to the groomers kind of soon but I'm thinking well you know I have to wait for her to be on this medication for two weeks she might need surgery like 
I'm gonna need to cut her hair on her own because if she does need surgery, like, she's not gonna be able to go to the groomers for a while, I imagine. So, I did cut some of her fur. I didn't do like her whole, like, little, little, uh, Pomeranian cut. I did like her legs and like her butt and tail pretty much. Like, I, I did the stuff that was getting kind of really wild and out of control. But I'm gonna order a pair of like proper, like, dog shears and do it that way next time and like try to just go all over and hopefully make her not look like a mess because I'm not like I'm not like cutting anything too extreme she's not like being treated like a topiary or something it's just very basic trying to make sure everything stays like even neat clean uh, and you know because like Pomeranian hair like it'll grow really really long like she'll she'll get like pretty crazy looking if I let it just like fully fully grow out and I don't want to do that because it, it's like eh. It's, it just, it gets dirty, it gets messy, it's easier to keep it nice and short. Anyways, doggos, doggo update complete. Okay. Um, yeah, we are starting early. Because I have things after the live stream I'm supposed to do. So, I decided to move up the stream a little bit. Today has just been like super hectic. I don't know. I don't know why. It just like it shouldn't. I'm like I don't know how I just spent the last six hours. Like it just didn't went. Whoop, I had like such a long to do list, and like now suddenly it's 5:30 or not even. It's like 5:45 at this point. This time flies today. Ooh, it's like 80 degrees Fahrenheit. That sounds wonderful. It is. What is the weather today? It is 52 degrees. Fahrenheit and raining so <laughs> this could be the temperature of any day between March and mid-June or like October like September October November like this is like the majority of the weather for most of the year I'm really sad though like it's supposed to be June but like it's totally not like summer summer weather yet I don't even know when it's when is it supposed to be like warm weather I don't even know. Because it was warm for like a couple days. I think it's supposed to be hot again like next week. At the end of next week. I don't want to wait that long. Come back to me, sunshine. Uh, do you have a TikTok slash do you ever plan on making content there? Uh, I don't have any plans for making a TikTok. I think I would if I had like let's say if like Instagram, Twitter, like everything else got obliterated. I would maybe make a TikTok. But I don't really, I don't want to film myself more than I already have to for my job. So I, I don't really see adding additional video content to like be something I'm, I'm super enthusiastic about, about doing. I know that TikTok, like I, it's, I've heard very positive things about TikTok from people like Pup Amp, but then I've also heard really negative things. I know there's a lot of misinformation on there. I know it's full of like Zoomers and teenagers. I don't really know how I feel about like, because as far as I rem as far as I know, we we talked about this a couple months ago. There's not really a good way to like age restrict your content. So like, there's not really a good way for me to make sure that like 13 year olds aren't like stumbling onto like my BDSM TikTok or whatever. So that would make me feel like awkward and uncomfortable. I just like I there's always inform there's always going to be misinformation like Facebook groups, Twitter it doesn't matter if there's a website on the internet, people are going to be be putting misinformation on it and you know I know that TikTok is a place where there's like there is some BDSM education some of it is like horrifyingly wrong or you know it's really the blind leading the blind like it's an 18 year old teaching another 18 year old and it's like you've been doing this for two months I don't know if I can uh trust your judgment or your source for this information uh and I think if I got on there I might end up just being like frustrated by like <laughs> how much misinformation there might end up being on there. I don't know. I have a very like my my instinct is to worry about the negative aspects of it more than think about the positive ones, but I'm not I'm not like saying never ever. I just like I I don't have like a positive impression of TikTok, let's say. I also like I don't expect the app to be to be very long lived in its current form to be honest because copyrighted music is so prevalent on that on that app that like I cannot imagine that like Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, 
Twitter, like all these websites were well, not so much Twitter because Twitter doesn't really have a lot of like video content on it, but anywhere like anywhere that has a lot of video content on it, like especially especially YouTube, especially Twitch like using any kind of copyrighted music on those is like impossible. Like you just you DMCA'd into oblivion. Like, and so I don't know how TikTok can like get around doing that for forever. Cause like eventually the music industry is gonna like find a way to be like, hey, you know, we want our cut of this. Or at least something cause like, there, or there's gonna be some kind of weird thing where you have to prove that like your TikTok is like transformative in nature or whatever. Like, there ha there has to be there's gonna be some kind of like weird like rules or something I think applied to TikTok around music so otherwise I don't know like how they they get around it and like I think the reason they got around it originally is because it's a Chinese app and like China doesn't give a shit about copyright infringement of American music they don't have to enforce any um any of our government government laws around um uh, copyrighted content and fair use and such like. That's my opinion though, I could be wrong. I would love to be wrong about like my impression of <laughs> why I'm afraid of using TikTok, but uh, I'm not necessarily hopeful. Uh, what is your favorite color? My favorite color is, well, purple, lime green, and black. Those are my favorite colors. And it's like a combo, like all three of those, all three of those together in particular is like a, like a powerful combo. Mm, I love your channel. I've learned so much since subscribing. Blessings. Thank you, Lady Bex. Glad you've been enjoying it. Um, oh gosh, okay, where, did, where did I end up in the chat? Thrive was really good. Thanks for recommending it. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thrive was really, was really, really good. I talked to one of the people that helps run the event and kind of gave them some feedback and let them know what people were, were thinking and feeling about it. And they were really appreciative of you know everybody going there and like how popular it was and they're definitely going to be doing it in the future so uh keep an eye out for future dates on that one uh i'm doing good it has been a really hectic busy day so far but happy to hang out with you guys for a little bit uh thank you for your videos the whole manson thing is so awful i can't stay but want to hit the like button thank you the like button bucket <laughs> Bucket of likes. No, like button. Uh, thank you, Cryptomeria. Okay, so this is one of the other things I wanted to talk about. So just, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit like, uh, sit like I'm in, uh, in Death Note. Okay, so this is actually how I normally sit in my chair. I do, cause this, this chair is, it's not a gamer girl chair. It's like a gamer guy chair. And so it's too wide, which is great. Cause I can sit up here with bandit and we're like we're both comfortable but i can sit in here like cross my legs and then like still stay inside the boundaries of the chair anyways uh let's have a little quick conversation about the marilyn manson content i it's so interesting to me because i think the majority of comments i would say like 90 percent of the comments are you know as positive oh my gosh wow thank you keel i watched you for a long time just wanted to support you and you give fantastic advice thank you so much oh my gosh we really appreciate it bandit appreciates it she's uh cleaning her paws right now she's bandit self-care <laughs> bandit self-care um uh, but yeah thank you so much oh my gosh so marilyn manson cons i would say like 90 percent of the comments are really positive yeah, uh, well, it's like, it's, I don't even know if I can call them positive. It's like, how can you be positive, like, reading about this stuff? But they're like, you know, you know, I hope these women get justice. Marilyn Manson is a shitbag. Like, just like, you know, the sorts of comments you would expect. But the other 10% are people, I would say 80% of the remaining, 80% of the remaining 10%. So 8% 8 of the comments are people that are like, it's so funny because like people that are like uh, like these women are like they always focus on Evan Rachel Wood and I'm like I didn't even mention Evan Rachel Wood in this video like they're like Evan Rachel Wood is a liar this is all being this is all these women are working together they're trying to take Manson's money they just want fame and it's like uh, it, I mean, no one mentioned Evan Rachel Wood in this entire video because it, like, it wasn't me or in my last video I don't think I mentioned her either I specifically go out of my way to not focus the narrative around Evan Rachel Wood because I think 
a lot of the people that are like uh, anti ERW or anti you know Esme or whatever like they they focus on that so much that they don't listen to any of the other accusations because they're so blind in their like apparent hatred for this one person for some reason uh so it's, it's interesting how many comments i get that are like you know Evan Rachel Wood is a liar i'm like this video didn't even have Evan Rachel Wood in it who are you talking about that is so funny and just like the level of conspiracy theory that people are like willing to assign to the whole nature of like the Marilyn Manson allegations is so funny to me like what what is simpler to believe is it is it simpler to believe that like 15 people and like five law firms are all collaborating together to do a coordinated takedown of a formerly famous musician from like the 90s that had like a controversial past like is that more likely or is it likely that a rock star with a drug habit lost his favorite wife and then proceeded to uh, abuse young women in an act of revenge for having lost Dita Von Teese. <laughs> like, what is more, what is more likely in that scenario? It's probably, it's like, and I'm just, that's like my, I should say, that last part is like, that's my guess. Because so many of the allegations start like post Dita Von Teese. So clearly something with his drug habit, his whatever. Um, oh, oh my gosh, Michael. Um, I'll add this and make it an even, an even scene up for you. Thank you for everything. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Michael. That's so sweet. Um, Bandit is honking. She appreciates. Are you okay, honey? Alright, Bandit is good. Um, I mean, that's, that's my, that's my, like, pet theory that I have no direct evidence for, is that, like, something with, like, his drug habit and losing Dita, like, I'm not saying he wasn't potentially violent towards women before that point. I just think it like really blew up after that is is what it is what it seems like. Ah, oh, thank you so much, Davy Bones. We are at the goal for the for the bandit camera. Although I may have to change my plans for that slightly because if she does need surgery, I don't know if she's gonna have like a cone of shame or like I know that might be kind of sad to have on have on camera. But I uh, thank you guys so much. That's so sweet. Um, in between me talking about Marilyn Manson, who would have guessed? Um, why is this position so comfortable? I feel like this shouldn't this shouldn't be comfortable, but this this is this is very comfortable. Um, yes, and that's my pet theory is that like something happened after after Dita that just like made Manson's brain go haywire. Like especially everything like all the journalists, all the other actors, like people that have you know corroborated the way that his house is like, his drug habit, like. There's so many of the other factors that think have gone together, and it's funny because they'll like, well, I saw a comment on this other person's YouTube channel that was supposedly from the director of this movie, and they said everything was consensual. I'm like, wait, so you are believing a random YouTube comment that is claiming to be a director of a movie that's a lost film from over 20 years ago, and you're taking that at face value as, as being the complete and and correct truth versus somebody's filed lawsuit like that's just and even then it's like even then like the, they aren't litigating like the nature of the movie it's just the 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 i think the thing that they would be litigating over is that like it was like the fact that Marilyn's actions around that movie caused this person, like, in it was, like, you know, intentional infliction of, like, emotional distress, it, 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 essentially. Um, because he did things like, you know, it doesn't matter if the film was actually consensual in nature. Like, let's say, let's say this is, like, let's erase the fact this is, like, a Marilyn Manson film. Let's, like, completely remove all of the Marilyn Manson context from this. If you have a girlfriend that like isn't kinky you haven't done kinky stuff with them really or you kind of just played around in the bedroom a little bit if you if you have like a blank vhs tape like a black spine vhs tape and you're like this is a really important film to me i need you to watch this with with me now i've only ever shown this to two to two people and it turns out that the tape is like like intense like hardcore german dungeon porn with like 
implied bestiality in it. Like, it's just, like, it's really, really intense, and you don't prepare the person for what it is. Like, you could say that everything on the film is, like, oh, cons it's consensual, like, all the models involved, like, sign release waiver, like, they know what's going on. If you show that to somebody unawares of, like, they don't know what they're seeing, they don't know what they're consenting to seeing, and then when they ask you, like, oh, my God, did the person in that, like, are they okay? Did they die? And you go... I'm not telling you, like, that is intentional infliction of emotional distress. <laughs> like, you are doing that because you are satisfied in making somebody else watch that thing. It doesn't actually matter if the thing on the tape is consensual or not, it's the way that you're using the tape. Like, it's the way that you're using it that matters and the effect that it has on that person. So I don't really think it, it like, matters if, like, the director says that everything on it was consensual or the person that was you know, supposedly a teenager on the film was really, like, 18 or something, it was legal. Like, it's it's about, like, the fact that, like, that's how it was used in the relationship, not the actual, like, is this tape involving, like, because, I don't know, I don't know, that's just, that's just my opinion about it. And, um, there's also people that, like, I've noticed some people get, like, <laughs> every once in a while, the remaining 2% of comments are, are people that are, like, um, are like upset that like I'm talking about the Marilyn Manson case like at all like they're 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 upset they're like you used to be like a cool BDSM educator why are you talking about the, this this uh, gossip and drama and I'm like if there was anybody else on YouTube that I that I trusted that was actually looking at this case and talking about when new documents come out and new lawsuits and new developments. Like if there was somebody else that was making YouTube videos about this that I trusted that was actually covering the events, I would rely on that and I wouldn't feel as compelled to talk about it and update about it, but I but I don't. I, I don't have anybody, at least that I'm aware of on YouTube, that's, you know, going, that's reading the actual lawsuits that are filed, that is going through literally step one, two, three, four, every line, every page of the lawsuits, not just like reading off the headlines that says, you know, Marilyn Manson wanted for arrest or something. The reason why I do these videos is because, you know, even when you do read things like the articles from The Cut or TMZ or whatever it is that has like, that's summarizing the allegations in, in the lawsuits, they're always missing stuff. They're always sort of in, they're having their own interpretation of what's in the lawsuit and they very rarely actually show directly what's in the lawsuit. And then you read it and you go, whoa, they totally missed this whole entire separate accusation in the lawsuit. They they missed this like big piece of evidence. Like that's why I that's why I do it. Um, cause also frankly, it's like really mentally draining to read that stuff. Like it, it is really mentally draining and I like, I feel like, well, if I can summarize it and keep people updated, then like people stay updated, which is good. And, and like, I don't want the only voices on YouTube that are talking about the Marilyn Manson case to be people that like think it's a bunch of scorned women trying to get money off of a washed up rock star. Like <laughs> that's like, I don't want that to be the only like ongoing narrative. Cause obviously the people that are Manson fanboys are like making videos every single week about everything that happens. Um, and I, like, the YouTube algorithm is like a funky game, and the more often you put out videos on a specific thing, like, the more your videos are going to be, like, pushed up in recommendations. Um, so yeah, it's, it's complicated. Or people that get upset and make, like, clickbait titles, like, clickbait titles. I feel like maybe people have different definitions of clickbait, because for me, I don't consider what I do to be, like, clickbait. I, like, because clickbait for me is, like, purposely deceptive. Like you're putting stuff in the thumbnail or in the title that isn't in the video. And I, I make sure that everything I use in my thumbnails and in the titles are actually in the video. So like the background is like a blurred up page from one of the lawsuits. The photos are from the articles that I talk about in, in the video. The quotes are from things that are actually said in the video. You know, there's the actual, the, the, I have like the titles of, the different articles I reference, maybe of something like the one that was like Marilyn Manson wanted for arrest. Like the reason I put that in there is because I saw so many people that just read that headline and didn't put anything more complexly into it and just thought that it was connected to the other cases. But it, it wasn't. It was from something completely different that happened in New Hampshire like two years ago. And uh, that's why I put it in there. And so, yeah, it's like it does get people to click on the video. So it is clickbait technically, but it's not deceptive. I don't mean it maliciously. It's just like. I don't know, like, how else, like, <laughs> I don't know how I cannot make a clickbait, like, like, the, the nature of the filings and the, and the ongoing, like, Marilyn Manson story is, like, 
clickbaity in and of itself because like it's Marilyn Manson it's like the famous one of the famous I should say shock rockers of the 90s like it, the, the these salacious stories of him you know using his ex-girlfriends as like drug mules on planes across Europe and you know taking virginities of Eastern European women while he's on tour and like committing statutory rape like the the acts that are in the documents themselves are already like salacious and clickbaity so I don't know how to like not make it that way without also like I want to treat it like seriously I don't want to be like I, I could make like a white background in Times New Roman font that just said Marilyn Manson news update and just have it be as plain as possible but uh, you know um, I feel like people don't understand this about like the 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 YouTube game because you know this is my job and I I like to be good at my job and one aspect of that is like making sure people watch videos and for the most part I I think I have like pretty bland thumbnails I don't go out of my way to make them over the top but when it comes to news stories and things like that where I'm trying to kind of show people what's going to be talked about in the video before they click on the video like that's the point like. The photos, the articles, the headlines, like that represents what I'm going to be talking about in the video. I don't like, I, I don't want to treat it like too blandly and just like a picture of my face or something as the thumbnail. I don't know. I don't know how, again, I don't know how to not make it clickbaity when like the stories themselves are like already so outrageous to begin with. I just find it funny that like random people get offended. They're like, ah, what are you doing? You used to be a cool BDSM educator. Now I'm making these stupid videos with clickbait thumbnails. And it's like, like, I still make BDSM content. That's not changing. The you know, I I think I I've made five total videos about Manson or various stories like it at this point. Like ninety nine point eight five percent of my content is still like BDSM, asexuality, polyamory type stuff. So I don't know why like people are upset about it. But it also like it does tie into like at the end of the day, this does all still tie into BDSM because the number one excuse. And I'm going to talk about this in the like actual part three video is the number one excuse that people have is that like, oh, these are like consensual BDSM relationships. And now these women are going back on their word and saying they didn't consent when they really did. You know, Manson is a freak. He's a dom. He's a top. He's a sadist. And so like he's just doing things consensually with women. And then now they're trying to use that against him to get his money. Like th that's the main excuse that people use is the like, oh, you know, well, first of all, these things didn't happen, but if they did, they were consensual BDSM. And if they did happen, it wasn't his fault. And like, you know, they go through the whole narcissist prayer essentially, but for like a different person. And, um, and or, or especially with, with Esme, um, they like, they say that like Esme couldn't have been abused because she used to be like a BDSM fetish model, for example. She, um, modeled, I think, for, for Libidex or Breathless, a couple, one of those places, or one of the UK based uh like latex places uh she uh worked at torture garden like she did like bdsm adjacent and like fetish wear sort of stuff and so therefore because she was she should have known what was going to happen because like clearly esme was aware of bdsm and it's like like it always goes back to like people defending manson's accusations as him just being into like edgy sex and like well it wasn't really that he's abusive it's just that like you know he's a sadist he wants to like no that's not what it is <laughs> like look at like where in here does anybody mention anything about like we had a bdsm contract or anything there's not and guess what guess what even if there was a piece of paper that says bdsm contract like signed in blood like you that is not legally binding <laughs> like that's not that's not a valid contract that's not supported in contract law i'm so sorry anyways i'm gonna stop rambling about manson because i could i could go on that for for a hot minute but i do find it interesting like how um some some people react that they almost feel like they have a right to tell me what kind of content i should make or how i should make it like i don't know that just feels that feels weird that feels weird to me uh, and I'm not gonna lie, like, part of it is I don't know how long I can make BDSM content on, on YouTube. Like, my, my videos get restricted all the time, you know, even though my channel is monetized again, like, 95% of my videos, uh, don't actually get fully monetized. Like, it's a very, like, it's a very tricky slope on YouTube for what content is and is not allowed, and so I am anticipating that at some point YouTube will make the decision that BDSM content isn't allowed on YouTube. So I'm trying to find stuff that I feel like I can still talk about on YouTube that I can pivot to and like one of those things is like 
news and current events and covering lawsuits and stuff like that. So I'm kind of testing that out as well to see like, oh, like theoretically if like BDSM was like banned as a subject on YouTube, like what else could I talk about? Um, that like people want to listen to and, and you know appreciate my voice on and so like that's also part of it as well as like my my doomsday prepping for YouTube's inevitable implosion uh, like Tumblr suddenly banning pornography like I you know after Tumblr like suddenly banned porn after they were bought by Yahoo I, like that taught me the lesson like that was like you have to be prepared to like pivot and like the way that you're doing things right now could could be completely changed overnight and to be prepared to kind of roll with that as best you can. Anyways, taking a break from talking about Marilyn Manson, let's read some comments, let's read some questions. Let's go. Um, how do you handle, oh, this is, we're hitting with the heavy questions here, Nick. How do you handle losing a BDSM dynamic in your life? Uh, the best advice that I have gotten, uh, recently especially, um, that I don't think I've emphasized enough is losing a relationship is a source of grief. Even if it was a short relationship, BDSM is intense. It can be a very deep bonding experience. So even if your kink relationship lasted, you know, a couple of months, not even years, like that can be a source of grief. And with grief, you have to go through grief to be able to let go of it. Like grief's gonna find you wherever you are you can't go around it can't go under it you can't go over it you got to go through it and the sooner you can accept and go through that grief process that will allow you to come out on the other side and be able to feel whole again and engage in bdsm again and do the things you love to do but if you try to you know shut down your pain fill it with other people, ignore it, run away from it. Like those are temporary fixes, but they're never going to get you through the difficult process of grieving. And I can't even say for myself in terms of like my longer kink relationships, uh, you know, I would say that all the longer kink relationships that I've experienced ending, like it, it's always taken a couple months to fully get through it. And it's not like every day is unbelievable unbearable pain but like sometimes it is hard like sometimes you get really sad at, like 6 p.m because like you're thinking about this person and how you no longer get to do this thing that you love to do with them and that you miss them and stuff like that but you have to be able to go through that in order to get through it and come out the other side and if you try to say oh what does it really hurt or i didn't really care that much or i hate this person like yeah that's not actually going to be able to truly fulfill your healing process now that doesn't mean there's nothing that you can do to ease the pain at all right like you know reconnect with your friends invest in being part of your local community you know go to munches even if they're online you know if you had a lot of investment in this relationship to the point where like you stopped doing certain hobbies and you know you missed out on like talking to certain friends and you lost kind of other connections in your life like take time to reestablish those and, and talk to those people again, embrace those hobbies, find the interests that are yours that maybe you had to leave behind because of that relationship. And just like, you know, have fun in life, like discover what it's like to be just like you by yourself again. You know, take, take yourself on walks, go for a walk with your dog, enjoy the sunshine. You know, like it's okay to be on your own and the more okay you can be with being on your own and f in feeling steady in that I think the easier easier it is and definitely like relying on your community talking to your friends and and finding things that make you make your life feel happy besides just that person or having that kind of relationship I think is, is really important but it's like it's not it's not an easy process like dealing with dealing with a breakup or losing a dynamic is really hard and also depending on what side of the slash you were on when that relationship ended like there's also the complicated factors of like you know, kind of deprogramming yourself from a BDSM relationship, learning how to let go, go, go of rules, learning how to handle that loss of structure in your life. Um, you know, if you were dominant that had certain things done for you as a service, like, you know, taking on those responsibilities again, or as a submissive, taking on those responsibilities again that maybe a dom used to do for you. Like, there's a lot of other things that are very complicated and, and kind of 
individual to each dynamic depending on on how long you were in it and what you did and the nature of your, your dynamic like that can also be complicated as well but I'm kind of thinking in more broad brush general getting through the loss of a breakup and I'm, I'm by no means an expert on it I'm I'm definitely not perfect at it but those are the things that I have found um, has really helped me when I keep them in mind uh, uh, the mayhem event says 2022 it's supposed to say 2021 no um, so that is for self um, so June 16th to 19th um, that is for like next year for like the in-person events unless I'm just like let me see if it uh, mayhem because there's self, which is like the Southeast Leather Fest, but this is this is self presents mayhem, which is June eighteenth to June twentieth. So twenty, I think twenty twenty two is the next like in person self conference, but mayhem is like separate from that. It's like it's the same organization, but it's a slightly different event. I don't know if that helps answer the question, but yeah, the website the website is like, I mean, listen, I'm never gonna fault anybody for their website design because like. Good website design is is expensive and confusing, but uh, yeah, it's 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 a little bit uh, a little bit confusing to to navigate through. Uh, what is your favorite thing to cover doing BDSM education? Um, what is my favorite thing to cover? I would say, in a general sense, I like covering like niche, like kind of misunderstood areas of BDSM. So. Um, like, let's say you have, I'm going to move, like, I realize I've, like, scooted away, I think, or get, get closer, come closer to me, YouTube chat, mm. okay, could I be more awkward, okay, um, yeah, I, I, uh, so what was the question? Oh, what's, what are my favorite things to cover? I definitely, I enjoy covering like niche communities like within BDSM or like things that are widely misunderstood. So I think that the videos I've done on like ABDL, for example, or like Dominant Littles, like I find those videos to be very rewarding, even if not very many people watch them because I know every single time I make one of those, I know that there's people that watch that and are like wow this is like exactly me I feel so seen I didn't know there was a word for this or like this is a really great representation of my community like this is you know one of the best videos I've seen on this you know a lot of people just kind of make fun of us like you know stuff like that and I feel very very rewarded in doing that like I mean you know I like making the videos where you know it's very general and like a lot of people want to know what bondage is or how to do suspension or whatever but I find those very niche topics, even if they don't kind of draw as like a wide interest, I find the people that do watch them get a lot out of them. And I know that that information is going to be there for as long as YouTube is around and that video is around for like future people who are wondering can maybe find it and go like, oh, there's a word for this thing. I didn't even know there was a word for it. So that is what makes me the happiest is like those sorts of subjects. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I'm making sounds like I'm a therian that shouldn't ther th thermian thermium what's the intro what's the instrument um that's like the uh, Star Trek like original series like <laughs> intro <laughs> is it a is it thermian thermos what is the word it's like it's a oh now I'm gonna have to google this uh ther No, that's Galaxy Quest. That's not what I want. Uh, in th theremin. It's uh, T H E R E M I N. I have no. How how the hell do you pronounce that? It literally doesn't even give a pronunciation guide when I Google it. Wow. Okay, well, whatever that word is. That. <laughs> that. That. Uh, let's see. Uh, heart Home Farm Girl. My partner has a hard time getting into a place where she feels comfortable 
getting into the mood to participate in a scene as a dom. I know you're not a dom, but I was wondering if you had any ideas. I feel like I feel like I have a video where I've talked about like how to get into like the headspace for a scene. So there's a lot of tools you can use to to do this. Uh, one is like don't pressure yourself. This is the number one thing. It's like it's like you have to kind of take yourself for who you are and for like some people they feel like dom energy like all the time they kind of go whatever and for other people it is much more ebb and flow some months they're really into it a lot other months they're like you know a couple times you know once a week something like that so you have to kind of one take yourself for who you are and not pressure yourself to be more into something than you're really into because then you're not being honest with yourself and then ultimately not being honest with your partners in terms of how much they can expect from you but after that point the next thing i think is like you can develop ways i think of getting more into your headspace for what makes you feel dominant so this is going to like take introspection on the part of your partner to cultivate what they find makes them feel dominant right having their nails done wearing certain outfits wearing certain colors listening to certain music uh watching certain movies you know there there's lots of different things like wearing a very certain pair of, of heels there's lots of things that can make you feel more like your dommy self and if you reserve those things for when you want to do dominant stuff then naturally your brain will start to associate them even more strongly with like dominant behaviors to the point where at some point like putting them on helped you get into your dom headspace even when you weren't there to start with so creating that strong association between between objects articles of clothing certain smells sounds music all that stuff can go a long way towards being able to get yourself into that headspace especially when you're trying to tra transition from everyday life like work errands groceries to suddenly now i have to be a dom and like ready to get into a scene and when you have that clear separation between like here i am here's how i dress like everyday normal stuff versus here i am like dom mode like you can also kind of your brain kind of make a separation between like normal everyday mode stuff and like oh now we're in dom mode kind of that's like the other other good reason why having those uh you know physical or auditory cues is, is really really good um but uh you know i think also the mood thing can be it's important to recognize could this motorcycle literally be any louder what do you every day every day <sighs> anyways what was i what was i saying before the motorcycle destroyed my brain oh well i think part of it is you also have to kind of examine what's going on in, in this case what's going on in their life uh you know what's going what's going on in your life right uh, like is work really stressful are you dealing with family issues are you getting adequate sleep are you you know how's your mental health doing are you like how's your medication situation doing like what is going on in your life and how might that be affecting your ability to do bdsm because i find what hap oftentimes happens is like people are really you know something my partner doesn't like really want to be a dom anymore and i can't figure out why and it's like well it's because they just got a promotion at work and now they're working 60 hours a week and then also like their dog got sick and oh also like their one of their siblings is getting married and they're gonna be like a bus a best man or a maid of honor and they have all these obligations and they're trying to you know plan a a, a bachelor or bachelorette party oh and also like their car's in the shop and they're on this new diet and they're trying this new medication and it's like whoa there's like a bunch of bunch of factors going on there that's really changing the you know, mental environment for this person and so there is a lot of changes going on elsewhere like it's very normal and natural that that's going to mean that like your dom headspace if that's something you're in like all the time every day and you have to kind of let it come out like if your brain's in like we're just trying to survive all this stress and new stuff going on and all these things are changing like your brain's not gonna like let that dom mode come out as much um, so you can try to like minimize stress, make time for relaxation. Some people do find it helpful to pre-plan a time for scenes. So, you know, have Wednesday night, you know, Friday night, Saturday night, whatever, whatever is free for you guys and your schedule, because I don't know. 
you can have a night of the week if you live together especially this works really well but it, you know it doesn't have to be that you live together i don't really know how well it would work like long distance but you could probably do it but if you set up a time every week where you're gonna do bdsm or have a date night or something like it could be you get dinner you could watch a movie and then like you know you're you're handcuffed to the chair or whatever like it can be really really casual just a little bit of bdsm just to like have that like regularly in your relationship at a set time but it can also be a time where if they're feeling it they can you know you can plan more of a full-on scene or service or something else that you both you want to have in your relationship but it allows you to have that time set aside so that way you know you're you can have that time for bdsm but then it also allows you the flexibility to do what is capable and feels good for you based on where you both are at and where your energy levels are. So that's one other thing to consider as well that can be a helpful tool, but it totally depends on your individual circumstances as per usual. Why are dogs so cute and innocent? I don't know. I th if science could figure that out, that I, I'd like that, please. <laughs> please let me know. hundred degrees in SoCal that is a little excessive please calm down sunshine <laughs> ah, oh interesting I attended a virtual event last night about sex positive parenting was a nice experience that sounds very interesting is that with, like a BDSM thing or just like is is sex positive parenting like a is there a book on that <laughs> can I recommend that for people because I get a lot of questions about like I want to do BDSM but I have kids, what do I do? If that goes into that, I would totally be interested because that, that feels like a book title, book title sense happening from that. Yes, it is date night today. There, there is, there is tea. I'm going on uh, my first actual date out to a place with a thing, with a, with a human person, with a human person uh, for the first time in like two years. So uh, I, I don't really, I don't really feel nervous. I'm not really nervous. I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to handle the sensory environment of like being in a restaurant. Like that's what I'm worried about. I'm like, oh, restaurants are loud. There's like lots of people. Because I've walked by restaurants before because there's a lot kind of around where I live. And like I walked by them before and like, I, I'm like there's so many people in there. So like how did I handle like going to these places <laughs> like before, before COVID and now that it's been COVID for a little bit of a hot minute, I... I don't know how I'm gonna handle going back to it, but I think the place I'm supposed to go to has pretty limited seating and has outdoor seating, so it shouldn't be like too too hectic. I, just, I don't know. I do have an escape plan. <laughs> I have an escape plan if necessary. Jeez. <laughs> oh, okay, literally everyone else has like way warmer weather than what I have and I'm extremely jealous although I'm not I'm like I kind of am but I'm not because it was like 85 degrees here like suddenly like literally overnight like two weeks ago and oh my god literally like my face was melting like because there's no AC there's no overhead fans like there's like you're like you just shit out of luck like if there's if there's any kind of hot weather going on where I live in this apartment like I have no way to make like the room feel cooler in any way other than like running an ice cold bath like that's my option and I took like a cold bath like three days in a row just to try and, and get things a little bit cooler uh, it helped but uh, I really like to have some kind of fan AC situation happening but it does not <sighs> I say it's raining, but like it's not. It's like this very, like I can hear it drizzling, but I don't see it. It's like misting. Misting is the word. That is what's happening. I mean, I could debunk misinformation on TikTok. I just worry that I like, it just seems endless. Like, I don't know. <laughs> Would I ever be done? Would I ever be finished with misinformation? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know that TikTok creators can make money unless they can migrate viewers to another platform like Twitch. I think they do, though. I don't think there's ads on TikTok, but there's, like, product, like, 
placement stuff and like sponsors and stuff like I think people get paid to like show things or talk about things in their TikToks but I don't think there's a way to directly monetize the content itself like through ads and stuff like that I think it's more like sponsorship deals <laughs> am I Maleficent I listen I have a Maleficent latex hood uh I you can make your own decisions about that one I will say that that one was like we had this big like this big storybook of like Disney stories that were like printed in, in a big book obviously like in you know because this is like peak you know golden age Disney stuff and I definitely remember spending a lot of time looking at the dragon from Sleeping Beauty like I definitely remember being like oh thorns dragon cool like <laughs> that one really fascinated me for some reason oh okay we got a multi-part question here all right let's go I'm ready. Let's do it. Uh, I've been involved in the BDSM community as a submissive for the past four-ish years, but I'm starting to explore my dominant side. Any advice on what sort of questions I should ask potential subs specifically for power exchange dynamics? I have quite a bit of experience with this as a sub, but it seems to be a bit different as a dom. So I would say, first of all, I have like, I have like, couple of videos talking about negotiations and what sort of questions to uh like talk about um so it sounds like you're asking about like an actual like a power exchange dynamic like not talking about scene negotiation uh so i mean i think all like the normal like the, the basic basic stuff applies obviously right like you want to talk about like hard limits, soft limits, preferences, boundaries, goals, like you want to talk about their ideas, right? Like I usually, I like to ask people questions like, um, you know, like what do you ideally want to get out of like a power exchange relationship? Like what is your goal? Like from a power exchange relationship? Cause like different people are going to be motivated by different things. And if you're not compatible with that, it's going to be hard to have a relationship that's going to be able to thrive for both of you. So, you know, if they're really into it because they like the sexual aspects of power exchange and like you're more into service, th that can overlap, but not necessarily always. So definitely I would talk about like, what it, you know, what are your goals? What's your ideal situation? Uh, you know, for power exchange, you know, their previous experience level, how long they've been in the community bef before, if they've done power exchange before, what they find the most motivating about it. Um, you know, just like kind of really establishing kind of what their experience is with it that's existing and what they ultimately want to get out of it. Um, and then obviously you want to talk about things like in terms of, uh, you know, I, I would ask questions about, you know, what like, and how do I phrase this? like daily interactions like what kind of contact expectation do, do they have like is this something where uh you know where you're checking in like constantly all the time like or also like what kind of flavor of dynamic you want to have right um like you know what are they looking for in a dom like do they want kind of like a cold distant dom that's going to order them to like you know take blackmail photos of themselves and like send send pictures or do they want somebody that's like more of a you know a caring loving I hate this term soft dom like I, I just I I try to be accepting of all people's kinks and labels there's something about the term soft dom that I just can't I'm like I feel like this is a, a, a useless phrase but people may use that for themselves and that's fine um but like you know or like a mommy dom do they want like a CGL dynamic a pet play dynamic do they like service do they want something that's like you know historical role play right Victorian household 1950s household uh, do they want to, you know, cross dressing? Like, what are, what are they looking for, right? Like, what kind of flavor do they want to have to the dynamic itself? And like, oh, you know, title title usage. Do they want to have a contract? Do they want to have like an outline set of rules? How do they feel about punishment? Uh, you know, there's 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 all sorts of things you could get into, and there's always going to be more questions that need to be asked, no matter how many questions you ask up front. So that's why I consider it really really important to make sure you have that time in your relationship to really, really regularly check in. Like I, like at the beginning of your dynamic, I would check in at least every week, at least every week, start slowly, add rules slowly over time. All the advice you guys heard me say like a million times before, but especially at the beginning of a new power exchange dynamic, especially do it then. Like do it more than you think that you need to. Cause it, it's better to have a five minute meeting where you like establish that everything's fine and okay, than 
have your partner be silently flailing around and hating something for a week because they feel like they couldn't talk to you about something. So, you know. I would have to, like, in order to answer this concisely, I would literally need to, like, sit down and, like, make a concise list for myself and, like, the order I would ask things in and, you know, there's no, like, perfect one way to do it. Uh, and I think over time, the more experience you have as a Dom, you're going to be able to refine what questions are necessary based on the dynamic that you want to have with people. And, um, you know, especially because because you are just starting to explore your dominant side. I also just, as a, as a general piece of advice, I if you're just starting to explore your dominant side, I do not recommend getting into a power exchange dynamic. Uh, and that goes for, for submissive or for dominant. I really think it's the most beneficial to start things either topping and bottoming or doing power exchange in scenes. That is what I would recommend personally, not a requirement. I just feel like that has the, that gives you the most practice time. That gives you the most practice time to figure out what questions work, what doesn't, what you want from a relationship, what you want from a play partner, right? Do you want like a brat that's going to fight you a lot and, and tease you and, and sing and dance and carry on? Or do you want like a quiet, obedient, submissive? Like, or something between those two things, or somebody that does both, right? The more that you take time to top or bottom first, or just do power exchange in scenes, the more time you have to refine what you're looking for. Because even though you have experience as a submissive, what you want as a dominant can be very different from who you are as a submissive. So I think the more time you give yourself to answer those questions, the better answers you're gonna get, I think is what I'm trying to say. Oh my gosh, we have a sticker. Thank you so much, Alexa Kim. Very cute. It's a lemon and then like, it's like a blueberry, I think, on a blanket on the floor. It's very sweet. Thank you. Hopefully that answered your question. It's very like, it's, it's difficult to answer concisely, but hopefully I at least started to get close to it. Uh, the divorce between Manson and Von Teese was definitely one of the messiest divorces celebrity wise. Really, was it? Because I don't remember it at all. I don't, like, that one just wasn't on my radar. Like, celebrity marriages and divorce was, like, not something I, I really cared about. My understanding is that they kept, like, the reasons behind the divorce, like, very quiet. Like, it was, like, suddenly they were splitting. I think Manson was really torn up about it, but I don't remember it being, like, publicly messy. Or was it? I just wasn't paying attention. I just wasn't, it was not on my radar of things that was happening at the time. Um, is a code of shame ever used for pet play? It is. I have one. If you go to the pet store, if you go in for like an extra large dog breed, it could totally work for a human. You didn't hear it from me though. It's like my, my quiet advice. Yesterday, went to my first munch since COVID, and I have lost all of my social skills. Still had a good time, though. I mean, I always take solace in the fact that I know I'm never alone in that. Like, I I know that I'm afraid I've lost my ability to tolerate being around other human beings and loud noises, but I know that most other people are going to be somewhere in the same boat as me. Like, either they're going to struggle with socializing or knowing how to talk to people or making eye contact or sensory issues or anything else like other people are also having to deal with coming back into the community and life and socializing so uh that can be comforting it's, uh it's not always the case like some people did socialize more some people are just so extroverted they get right back into it i am not that person and i would even hazard a guess that even the majority of the bsm community is not that way i feel like we're a pretty oh my god that wasn't, that was not a motorcycle, but it was a large truck? I don't know. This is all the loud vehicles are happening today. All of the loud vehicles. What? I can't have party monsters. I can't watch party monsters anymore because they can't. Marilyn Manson as a trans woman. God, that was like a weird, that was a really weird part of comedy in the 90s, wasn't it? Where it's like, man, cross dresses. It's funny. Ha ha ha. What the fuck? What is this movie? Uh, M Macaulay Culkin in this? I, 2003, what in, what in the fucking, yes, yeah, Marilyn Manson's in this movie, what the hell? I have, I have, 
I can't look at this. This just seems cursed. Like, no, no, not to insult your movie taste by any means, but just like, I just, the vibes I'm getting from this are absolutely just, just sinister, just sinister vibes from this movie. That, that may be the Marilyn Manson half of it, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I know, Evie and Legal Eagle crossover, I mean that... <laughs> I don't even imagine, I don't even think Legal Eagle probably reads his own emails. Like, he's probably way too busy. Although, I will say, I'm very disappointed that, like, Emily D. Baker or, like, I don't know, has anybody, like, any of the big legal channels, I don't think any of them have covered the Marilyn Manson lawsuits. And, like, these lawsuits are bananas. Like, there's, there's, like, there's, I don't want to call it hot goss, but, like, it's not, because it's not gossip, but, like, it's... Like, I'd way rather read about, like, people talking about their Marilyn Manson lawsuits than fucking part 73 of, like, Tati Westbrook's, like, ongoing litigation for, like, copyright or whatever. Like, oh God, it was so boring. Um, I feel like, like, covering the Marilyn Manson stuff could be really interesting, but for some reason people just aren't, it's not like, it's not like Marilyn Manson's team is, like, going around taking out videos that talk about him or something, but people seem really reluctant to cover it, and maybe that's because it is, like, sex crimes basically uh and and that can be really like emotionally difficult to talk about and i definitely want to be empathetic with listening to that but if it's not like for reasons of like it's emotionally distressing to discuss this like i i would wonder why you wouldn't cover it if like your vibe as a, as a legal channel is to talk about like pop legal things ongoing uh, you know the you know free britney uh tati westbrook lawsuits james charles getting sued by his you know ex-employee for uh, you know not paying all, all their wages or something you know just like that stuff i feel like come on marilyn manson you talk about everything else that happens like <laughs> why not this because I try, like, I try to, in, like, I, well, I wouldn't even say I try. I, like, I don't make commentary about the legal validity of what is being alleged in the facts of a lawsuit. Because, like, I don't know. I'm not there. I don't have access to the evidence. Nobody does, except for the people that are working on this case. But I feel like it might be important to have that perspective. I just, like, I feel like I don't need to get into, like, the merits of like does this thing actually go along with the thing that they're saying in the lawsuit like in terms of like does this meet the definition for the california statute related to sexual battery like i don't know i'm not i i, I haven't passed the bar in the state of california but it, it could be i just don't know how relevant that is compared to just the nature of the accusations themselves in the lawsuits at least from like my purpose of talking about it but I wish that somebody would examine that because it's probably going to be a very, very long time before even the majority of these lawsuits are worked out. <laughs> How am I an hour late? I was trying on New Year's in a collar, dang it. Listen, I when I'm coming up with outfits, I definitely lose a few hours in my day. I also started uh, 30 minutes early, so that could also, also be why. So we're going to be done... Um, How does time work? I think we're going to be done in an hour in an hour 45 minutes something like that somewhere in there i'll figure it out i'll figure out when we're done it's my live stream <laughs> I, I know what i'm doing i'm steering this boat okay all right uh oh interesting how do you feel about gaming role play? Like, if you lose at poker, you get a punishment. Oh, okay, that was not what I was. I was expecting when people like role play sexual stuff during D and D, which I'll talk about my opinion about that if you guys want to know my opinion. Um, I feel like gaming role play. Like, I feel like that's that's totally legit. Like, I know a lot of people that like you know, oh, strip poker, strip pool, like whatever else. Like, if you if you think that's fun and you like it, great. You could literally play like Mario Kart and when you lose at Mario Kart, you have to remove an art article of clothing and then like kneel on rice like during the next round. Like, you know, you can have it be whatever you want and I think if, if that like vibes to you, if that's fun, if that like is how you want to do your punishment, go for it. I think that's, that's completely legitimate. Maybe don't do it if you're in a poker game at a casino with other people around. And actually, I should say, speaking of that, uh, we didn't get to do this because of COVID, but we did have a plan for a long time between a close group of friends and, and, and myself that 
uh, you know, we, we do events together a lot and they have like house parties and we were planning on doing like a 1950s household like power exchange poker night where like the doms would all be playing like poker and smoking cigars and drinking whiskey and eating chicken wings and then like the Smiths would be like a 1950s like household style like housewives and then like if like there was going to be some kind of we had some kind of thing set up where like depending on how many chips the doms lost like that would result in different punishments for their submissives that they would have to take and like it was very convoluted it was like more complicated than it needed to be but like you can also do that on a larger scale with other people as well if you have a, a good group of friends going mm -hmm. Hey, exactly. How to recognize it. predatory behavior is very important to BDSM. Like, you think people think that, like BDSM is just like all fun and games, and then you realize it's mostly trying to avoid people that want to axe murder you, and then getting to do the fun stuff. Uh, I just read the Mistress Manual by Lorelei. I had issues with this information. Part of it compared domestic discipline scene to the leather scene. It seemed off, maybe just outdated. Uh, I have never, I think that was on, that was on my list of, like, reading materials, but I think I have a disclaimer in there, so to clarify for people who don't know, I do have a list of BDSM reading materials of just, like, books I know that cover this subject. It is not necessarily an endorsement of the books on that list or saying they contain good information. It is just a library of, like, these are the books that are out there. I do scrub through and I get rid of books that I know are written by people that uh, like for example there's a very famous series of books two of them actually uh which are written by uh, somebody that was uh arrested and then convicted at trial um for trafficking a teenager across state lines for the purpose of a sexual bdsm relationship so uh definitely don't recommend their books about bdsm and there's also somebody else that's from the uk um, although i think all of his books have been off amazon for a while but i i removed links to them where he gave advice on how to do power exchange relationships and then it came out that he um abused his power over numerous women in the times that he played with them or had relationships with them so got rid of their books but outside of people i know that are like openly predators i generally just keep books on there because there's no way i can read all of them and different people want different things from books so i try not to be too judgmental about that i would say when you are reading things like uh, you know for femdom sp stuff especially if you're not doing it from like a how to become a professional dominatrix perspective there is definitely a lack of of information i do know there's a lot of literature that references like female-led relationships i don't know i see i don't know because i'm not i'm not like a femdom so i'm not familiar with this kind of side of things i i i don't believe that uh, female-led relationships entirely overlap with bdsm i think a lot of them naturally go to a bdsm flavor but i i get the sense they also exist outside of like a bdsm framework if that makes sense so there could also be other literature that kind of gets into similar areas but isn't exactly the same um yeah i from my understanding domestic discipline with like two d's like capital d's i uh isn't that like christian domestic discipline isn't that like like I like I believe that God literally created women to be inferior to men and subservient to them, and so therefore, the wife must f always and forever submit to the husband in all things, and and thus endure his punishments and spankings. Like there is certainly flavors to that that overlap with BDSM, especially if you like certain kinds of role play. For me, that definitely seems different. Like that definitely like I personally for me. I do not support BDSM that is built on a basis of legitimately BDSM that is based on a base that is based on a basis that is based on legitimately believing a category of people is inferior or superior to others based on some kind of individual quality. That could be believing that all women are superior to all men. That could be believing that men are superior to women, believing that you know, black men are superior to white men, whatever, like it could be any combination of races, genders, whatever. Any of that stuff where it's like my worldview is based on like some kind of, you know, either racist or sexist 
complex about you know certain people being superior to others naturally and that bdsm is a manifestation of like the natural power hierarchy i don't believe in that i think that is that is using bdsm as an excuse to act out your bigotry i'm not for that i think you can find ways to healthily role play with like role play concepts around like you know for example like am like amazonian role play where like you have this fantasy world you've made up where like like the amazonian women are like these strong superior goddess-like beings and the human men are taken as their captives to you know be used as their pleasure slaves or whatever like you can have like funny role play scenarios like that that kind of is like the this backstory for your relationship style but that's not based on like a real belief that women are superior to men in like some sort of biological truth way that I definitely don't support. Um, but yeah, Christian domestic discipline is definitely like not BDSM. And I've had people that get mad at me for saying that before. Um, I was raised Catholic. I feel like I'm allowed to have opinions about um, uh, religious discipline and how that affects people's lives. I am definitely not for, again, anybody that uses some kind of biological or spiritual truth about a category of people to act out so-called power exchange relationships. Um, I mean, there's overlap, but it's like, there are mushrooms that look similar and one of them is poisonous and one of them is not that does not mean they're both the same kind of mushroom like you know it's it's it, i think that seems like an outdated comparison and i i would certainly be reluctant to uh you know say that one thing is similar to the other and more than a very superficial fashion The hardest thing for me when recovering from the loss of a power exchange dynamic was letting go of rules. Yes, I think that, like, I, that's very much been my experience as well. I think that letting, go, and it could be rules, whatever it is they use for your term for structure in your relationship, letting go of that I think is difficult because that tends to be the most present thing that you also to some extent have to, like, facilitate on your own like like you have to be the one that obeys the rules right it's not always your partner telling you directly what to do it's like I have to make sure to do xyz thing I have to you know it's my responsibility I have to take this medication every day because my daddy says so I have to prepare my mommy's lunch every day before she goes to work I have to do xyz thing and like having that structure and rules and suddenly having it not be there anymore is like well I don't do this anymore and for me, the one that's always been very hard to let go is like the not being able to open my own doors thing. Cause like for a long time, like my, one of my former partners was like the only person I really like rode in their car with. And so like, I got so used to not being able to open my own door that I've been in more than one awkward scenario where I've been standing by somebody's like car door and then like awkwardly waited because my brain was just naturally being like, don't touch the doorknob because you are not allowed to open your own doors. And like letting go of that was really hard even for a long time afterwards. And uh, you know, I don't, I haven't really found a better solution for, for getting rid of that. Like if you have time in the end of a relationship, if it's a mutual end of the relationship where you decide to not renew your contract and move on to whatever, I think that's, you like how to, like i think that there's a way that you can more healthily end a ds relationship where you both get time to deprogram with each other for like more formally letting go of the rules and kind of slowly ramping down the relationship and that can make the transition a lot easier but like we usually don't get that opportunity we usually have some kind of like blow up fight something dramatic happens somebody was cheating on somebody whatever else and then like the relationship is suddenly over and when that happens we're kind of left by ourselves as submissives to figure out how to deal with that going forward and i haven't really found any great way to deal with that other than like new ds relationship or just letting time do its thing and uh you know i guess you could like replace i talked about this in my self collaring video um, where like I talked about the concept of self collaring I think you at least a little bit I talked about in there I have other videos where I've talked about this more in depth but you can also as a submissive like if you were recently uncollared and you still want that structure and you're kind of like coming down off of it like you can also give yourself your own structure and give yourself your own rules to follow and your own goals to follow 
and that might be a smoother transition transition for you versus just going back to like regular vanilla operation but for some people that could also be too painful uh, or they might not have the self-discipline to be able to do that. All of which is totally fine is about acknowledging where you individually are at and what would help you in that process. Mmm, the predator and prey video was amazing. It was really hard to find out more. Very appreciate it. I'm glad you liked it, Jenny. I really liked it too. Everybody's like, there, man. <laughs> Thermos. <laughs> yes. I listen. I, I am not good at words sometimes. Okay. No, don't judge me. Give me a second. Oh, what's going on? Okay, so uh, I just started researching and exploring Victorian house style role play. I uh, became interested in this because of the book Mary Poppins. Listen, we all got weird sources to our kinks, all right? It's, it's always children's movies. It always goes back to children's movies and books. Uh, do you know of any sort of resources on this? I know it's super niche. It's funny you ask because, like, I definitely took a class on like Victorian household service like at the first kink fest I ever went to so I know uh, see it's hard though because like are there resources for it yes are they specific to BDSM no <laughs> the majority of resources you will find for things like service etiquette you know period related you know flavors to your role playing power exchange the information you're going to get is from like historical literature or like from historical research. It's not going to be from like somebody in the BDSM community that created a book about this one very niche thing. There are some books like that for some things. To my knowledge, Victorian household stuff is not one of those, but you can find lots of inspiration very easily because people love the Victorian era. They love Victorian households and upstairs and downstairs and ladies in waiting and butlers and maids. Like there are so many books. I know if I, here, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go on Amazon right now on my little telephone here, my cellular device, and I'm going to just Victorian household book. I'm just going to see. Hints of household taste. The Classic Handbook of Victorian Interior Decoration. Ah, this is one of the recommendations I got from that class. I was kind of hoping to see this. Uh, Mrs. Beaton's Book of Household Management, the 1961 classic with advice on cooking, child rearing, entertaining, cleaning, and more. So that is definitely one of the classic recommendations. Um, there's also the abridged version for that as well, if you don't want the full thing. The, the, the original one's quite big. Um, how to Be Victorian, A Dawn to Dust Guide to Victorian Life by Ruth Goodman. And then there's a bunch of paperback and romance novels. Uh, the Victorian Catalog of Household Goods. Let's see. Can I just, can I filter out uh, romantic, r romantic books? I just, um, Victorian Household maybe just household management that also would be what I would look for um, yeah I think uh, true ladies and proper gentlemen Victorian etiquette for modern day uh, Sarah a Christman uh, mind your manners tried and true British household cleaning tips by Lucy Lethbridge what would Mrs. Astor do? The Essential Guide to the Manners and Mores of the Gilded Age. Yeah, there's tons of stuff. Tons of stuff going on. All right. 
Anyways, that's my quick Google search. Yes, it is possible, but it's very, very rarely actually like made by BDSM people. Okay, okay, lost the chat, where am I? I was looking at Amazon for too long. <laughs> Always more misinformation on TikTok, I call that job security. That is a much more positive way of looking at it, Spencer, that is for sure. That is for sure. Uh, do you have any style icons or influences? Uh, I mean, I have, you know, honestly, my favorite YouTuber, like style-wise, is, um, is it a Angela Benedict? I'm worried it's Angelina. <laughs> I'm, my brain's not, I think it's just Angela. Angela Benedict, yes, that's what it is. She is my favorite. We do not have the same facial structure, unfortunately. Oh, Bailey Sarian as well. Bailey Sarian and I have nothing close to the same face, but I like her makeup a lot. Um, probably Angela Benedict is like my most, my most direct style influence I think I would say uh would you ever do an updated video on knife play or would YouTube freak out about that I am planning on doing an updated video about that so it's funny you ask I am I don't think I don't think it would be any more risky to have on YouTube than anything else I've ever made just depending on what I actually do in said video <laughs> why do you hate the term soft dom so much uh okay I'm gonna preface this is Guys, okay, if you use the term, I'm not trying to insult anyone. This is strictly, this is the my, my own opinion zone. This is, this is, I don't like this term for me. This is just, I don't like it. I don't, like, it just, the reason why I don't like the term soft dom is because I think it arises from a stereotype because it's primarily used for female doms. Though I have seen more and more because I saw like I saw when soft dom was first made up as a term and then as it has evolved I think it's been adopted by like a wider array of people but it used to be very much used for like like female doms in particular and the reason why I don't like it is because for me it seemed to arise from the stereotype that normal female doms were like cold callous bitches and so you have to say oh I don't want that I want a soft dom in reality because soft dom doesn't necessarily like correlate with any one area of BDSM play, right? Like it's not like it's not like having like a pet play owner or like a mommy or a daddy or something. It's not really correlates with like a specific like role play flavor or something. It's a very like nebulous term. And so for me, I think it's better to understand that the general terms like dom, master, whatever, like they exist on the spectrum of like softness to to hardness right like you can have a mommy dom that is very caring and nurturing and loving and 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 kind and generous or you can have a mommy dom that's like you know mommy dearest like horrific sadistic like very very strict and mean like kind of mommy so like i think there should be this allowance built into any particular you know title for a partner i think you know mistress uh, you know, yeah, yeah, mistress, mommy, owner, daddy, um, sir, ma'am, whatever, like any of these terms, I think within them exists a spectrum already. And so I don't know if like clarifying soft dom really like is useful. Like, I don't know how useful of a term it really is. To me, it just comes from like perpetuating the stereotype that like normal female doms are this way. And so to talk about this other thing, you have to ask for this one thing. I'm like, I'm just like, I, I don't. I don't know. Maybe I'm just misunderstanding it. I just like, for me, because when I saw it come up, it was like, I think it was coming from like this stereotype that I wasn't super fond of like furthering this dichotomy of because I don't want there to be a stereotype there to begin with. That's just my opinion. I just like, because when people ask me like, oh, well, I want to have a soft dom. I'm like, what does that mean? Like, like or they, I've had a lot of people ask me like, oh, can you make a video talking about soft dominance? And I'm like, well, every dom has the capacity to be soft or hard. Like, it just, 
I, what is, like, it's so nebulous. Like, it seems so, like, I don't know how to, like, grab onto that to even, like, talk about what that means. Like, like, does it just, does it just mean you do you coddle your, do you, is it like a mommy-daddy thing? Is it like a mommy-daddy thing without like the parental connotations? Like, does it mean you don't do punishments? Like, it's just, it's just, it's so nebulous. I don't know how to like grab onto it to define it in a meaningful way. And like, I don't like just like making up words for like the sake of like saying stuff. Um, but yeah, it's not, it's not my favorite. I'm not saying you, like, you shouldn't do it or shouldn't use it. If you find it useful, go ahead. I just, like, I don't, I don't personally get it. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm also not going to promote the term in particular because I've never heard anybody ever in the real life community ever say the word soft dom. And, you know, the internet has invented a lot of very helpful terms for the BDSM community that has crossed over into real life. Um, but I don't want anybody to leave with the impression because that somebody says this thing on the internet that is reflected in the real life community. Um, and I, I just, I feel like it would just cause confusion if like you talked about it in real life. I don't know. I don't know. That's my opinion. I'm not saying it's like never going to change or whatever. I just like, I don't get it. Not my, not my thing. That's my hot take. That's my singular BDSM hot take. There you go. Mm. For a future video, I would really be interested in your thoughtful discussion on the concept of consent, giving it, revoking it, and as a partner, recognizing the difference. Like, recognizing difference between when somebody is giving consent and revoking it? Is that what you mean? Or, like, the difference, recognizing the differences of, like, do you mean, like, when somebody, like, says, okay, fine, but, like, they don't really mean fine? Do you mean like that? Or do you mean something else? Because I think that's a good idea. I think kind of, like, Consent is hard, consent is complicated, and having more questions about it, though some people are very much bored by it, I think is important. <laughs> now the neurotypicals know of the sensory issues. I mean, listen, I'm not going to say anything about the neurotypicality of my brain. I was going to say the fact I chose talking about BDSM on YouTube as a full-time job is maybe uh, indicative of how neurotypical my brain my brain is around socially acceptable life choices. Um. <laughs> mm. Okay, I answered the question on doing scenes with role-playing gaming, so if you missed that, that was earlier in the live stream. Just FYI. Um, uh, would you ever be open to doing an interview with someone who is pregnant and bottom for scenes? I know you interviewed someone who did kink while pregnant, but from what I remember, they... And then just... That was the end of the message. I don't, I don't see a second one. So I'm going to infer that they... But I, I think the person you're talking about is they primarily top uh, when they were pregnant. They did also talk about them bottoming as well when, when they were pregnant. Um... I, yes, the answer if you're if anybody is ever asking me a question of like are you open to interviewing X? The answer is yes uh, I don't randomly bring people on to to the interview on my channel when they say oh I know about this thing interview me like I have very like I'm gonna say I have very high standards I have standards for people that I interview I don't want to platform people that like have hurtful beliefs or have like a private TikTok account where they say racist shit or they've secretly been canceled in a local community. Like it's very hard for me to vet people outside of my local community. So I'm very worried about interviewing somebody that like has been banned from like the entire New Hampshire BDSM scene and I don't know it because I'm not from New Hampshire. Like, uh, like the, I'm always very paranoid about that, so I only really interview people that, like, I trust as, like, educators that I've learned from before that go to conferences where I trust their vetting. Uh, but yeah, the answer is, like, yeah, I'm always open to interview somebody about, like, any particular topic, especially when I don't have experience with that. Um, I feel like they covered, like, I, I feel like that, that was a pretty good interview in terms of covering, like, the risk of, like, of like being pregnant and doing BDSM and, and navigating play and pain and things like that. I feel like that was a really good interview. I don't really know what additional, like, the thing is as well as with interviews, I don't want to interview people about the same thing like over and over and over again. And so like if I feel like I've covered something in an interview, I'm not going to like do it again in a different one because I don't want it to just be the same thing over and over again. I don't really know what else somebody could answer that they didn't cover in that interview that I did with them. 
I don't know, like, I don't know really what's missing there other than, like, maybe a little bit of a particular perspective. But for me, I'm not going to do an hour-long interview that's just based around one question. Like, that seems, that seems, uh, that seems a little bit superfluous. But I, I can see why it would be valuable. I just, like, I feel like the interview I did already, like, covered a lot. And, like, I know that people would want more from a certain thing. But, like, I can't make perfect interview clients, like, pop up out of nowhere. Like, I can't, like, I can't just randomly find people that are going to perfectly answer everyone's very particular questions on a very specific niche topic. Uh, and, like, my advice is if you want answers to these questions, there are people on FetLife that have groups where they talk about this in detail and share their personal experiences. So if what you are looking for is the personal experience of women who have done BDSM while pregnant and they bottomed, like there are tons of groups on FetLife for people that are parents or are gonna be parents or have kids and they talk about that stuff on there. So I'm sure if you want that information in a very short, concise way and just reading people's experiences, there are hundreds of that probably on FetLife if you just wanna read other people's posts, so yeah. Welcome to your first live stream, Mariah. We're happy to have you here. We have, I'm gonna say 15 minutes left, I think. Mm. Date night is not the talking point, but I did start early partially because of it. We negotiated our DS dynamic to allow for a formal two month weaning process, two months to gradually transition out of rules and protocol little by little and spending time as platonic friends during that two month weaning process as well. I mean, that's like, that's like the ideal scenario. Like if you can do that, if you can do that for sure, definitely do it. Um, are there any trans BDSM peer educators that you'd recommend? And do you have any suggestions for a trans woman who wants to find a play partner that doesn't view her as a fetishizing way outside of scenes? Um, I don't, I definitely know trans women that are like kink educators. I don't know any of them that are on like a public platform. I don't know any of them that are on like YouTube or anywhere like that. They mostly teach in person real life events. I, I am not trans, so I cannot really give advice on how to find a play partner while navigating around that like fetishizing aspect of things but if I'm sure there's other trans women in the chat that might be happy to offer their experience and their advice in that regard because I I don't have that experience and I don't necessarily know how to navigate around that particular issue but I appreciate you asking I just wish I had a better answer I just don't uh don't have that particular lived experience Uh, I definitely I have tickling in the infinite again I always I always tell people this I literally have a list on my phone of like seeing like not seeing ideas although I do have a list for for that and then different not on my phone um oh what's going on uh yeah I have a list and I think last time I checked I literally permanently have like two years of video ideas to make and tickling is on there is on there trust me and then it's like but then fetishes are weird because it ends up being this like if you give a mouse a cookie problem where like when you talk about one fetish then everybody wants their fetish talked about like oh talk about latex fetishes talk about foot fetishes talk about heel fetishes talk about armpit fetishes talk about i'm on a fetish channel <laughs> bdsm channel having a fetish for a body part it's not the same thing as being in the bdsm community and like the answer to those things are like really like it boils down to the same kind of core things which is like why are people into this fetish what does it look like like it just it ends up being the same answer over and over and over again and I don't really know how useful videos like that are I think you can do tickle torture in a BDSM way which is why I would talk about it I'm always just worried because I don't know why but there is certain segments of fetishists that seem to have like no sense of boundaries online whatsoever like people with foot fetishes people with heel fetishes for some reason 
they just like can't help themselves on the internet. They just can't, they don't, they can't be appropriate and I don't know why, but it's like as soon as you even hint that you might go near something that is in their fetish interest, they lose their goddamn minds. Like they just like, oh mistress, please, please talk about your feet. And it's like, that's not what this video is going to be about. And so I feel really uncomfortable getting into fetish topics because I feel like people project me talking about fetishes as me being willing to participate in those fetishes with them in like a weird parasocial relationship kind of way and it's really uncomfortable it's really uncomfortable um but technically i would talk about because again you can do like tickle torture and stuff in bdsm that's like not related to a fetish but whenever i get close to a fetish topic the comments get real uncomfortable and i'm like don't want to go there um because again if you want to know about that literally violet blue fetish sex it's the only book you need It'll explain every different fetish in detail. I personally don't feel a need to make a video about every specific individual fetish when there is a book like that already out there that covers literally everything that I could cover and more. See, but this is the thing. This is why I don't like the term soft dom. Because it's like, I don't think soft dom is an oxymoron. Dom just means you have power in a scene. You don't got to be harsh or mean or whatever. But hey, that's it. Doms already don't have to be harsh and mean. Doms already don't have to be cold and stricter into edge play. Like, the term dom, like, people only think that doms are one way already. And I don't want to encourage this stereotype. If you're not a soft dom, then you're always other characteristics and traits. And it's like, well, that's not true, though, because, again, there's already that spectrum. And what being mean looks like, what being strict looks like, is also very subjective. Um, so that's, like, why I'm not a fan of that term. And, again, like, a positive reinforcement, already totally thing in, like, regular power exchange relationships. It's not, it does not in any way mean that it's exclusive to being a soft dom. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have revoking consent. I've been watching your Marilyn Manson videos. So if you consent to a BDSM lifestyle relationship and it goes off the rails, how can you clearly revoke consent within that context? Um, I mean, like, again, it, dep like, it depends on how you negotiate for that. But I feel like if it goes off the rails, like there's, um, Melinda Williams talks about this and she says there's this thing called the prime directive in BDSM relationships, which is that the, in, in, Melinda Williams does like MS relationships so the language is kind of reflective of that but what she says is that it is the property's responsibility to protect the property at, of the master at all times including up to and from the master so like the property has a duty to keep themselves safe including safe from the master and based on that guideline that means the property the slave the whatever title you use is able to and in fact has a duty to revoke the relationship when it does go quote unquote off the rails um however when it does go off the rails quite so fully um you can clearly revoke consent but that doesn't mean your partner will listen to you revoking that consent because you know it, it, in a really off the rail scenario they're gonna go well you're my slave and you're my property and they own you and you can never leave me so i don't care if you revoke your consent that's the nightmare scenario. So you can literally say, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm leaving. Our relationship is over. And they're going to go, well, you're my property. You actually can't leave. I still own you. And like, that's not okay. Also in that scenario, that kind of basically is, I'm going I'm to say it's probably full-fledged abuse. You're under no obligation to give that person any information about like, if it goes so off the rails that you are in danger of your life and well-being or the life and well-being of those that you love, like you're afraid of them getting threatened because of you leaving, you can secretly leave. Like, you don't have to have any big conversation about like, oh, I'm leaving, it's not working anymore. Like, if you feel in danger of your life if you try and leave, because if it is abusive, the most dangerous time is when you were trying to leave, you do not have to give anybody a big forewarning about like, oh, I'm going to leave, this isn't working, blah, blah, blah. If, 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 if your life could be in danger if you try to leave, if they could seriously harm you or try to hold you captive or, you know, hold your loved ones, your pet, your whatever it is that you care about most in life, like, captive or hurt or kill them because of you trying to leave, it doesn't matter how clearly you broke the consent. Like, 
you you leaving is you revoking the consent at that point. Um, but yeah, it's it. What you say is you say like clear like you can either have like a safe word for the whole relationship right there. It, if it's not like a totally off the rails abuse scenario, if it's just like this relationship really isn't working anymore, like you can have a safe word that's a safe word for the whole relationship. You can have something built into your contract that says, you know, when the submissive signs here, this indicates the conclusion of the relationship. There's a million ways you can indicate that you've revoked your consent to be in that relationship. You can put it in writing, you can send them an email, uh, you can say it out loud. I would recommend having something on record, um, you know, if you're worried about something legally happening. Uh, you know, have it in writing, having proof, um, you know, that you've done it, record a phone call, you know, if you have like a one party consent state where like you can re record the phone call like as, as long as you can consent to, to have it be recorded. If it's two party consent state, that's a little bit more complicated. But, uh, uh, you know, there are lots of ways to indicate that you've revoked your consent. But ultimately, how you clearly revoke your consent is you say, I don't want to do this relationship anymore. We are done. <laughs> it's really simple. It's really, really simple to be like, uh, no, I'm done, actually. No. Um, uh, and there's something in here that says I have to permanently be your slave for now and forever. So I, I'm revoking my consent to be in this relationship. We are no longer master and slave or dom and sub or whatever. Uh, I am walking away. You can just do that. It's fine. If somebody tries to say, oh, well, you can't because you promised to be my slave forever and you're my property forever, they are lying. They are lying. You can just leave. It is fine. I promise. They do not literally own your body. That is illegal. Uh, reminds me of a conversation I had with others in a kink server I'm in. Talking to those with foot fetishes and how it's a pain due to people thinking it's creepy and weird, then you have creeps. Well, here's the thing though. I don't think fetishes themselves are creepy. I don't think foot fetishes are creepy. I have had three boyfriends that have had foot fetishes. I do not think they're weird. What does not make sense to me is how people with certain fetishes on the internet, it's like, I know that you exist in real life. I know that you're normal, rational people in real life that like approach your relationships consensually, but then online you're messaging 15 year olds on Instagram to send, <laughs> to send you feet pictures because they don't know it's a fetish thing. Like what happens to your brain between real life and being on the internet that makes you act in such like, like irrational, like fetish need minded ways that is just treating other people as fetish dispensaries. Like I do not understand what happens. And that's what I have a problem with, not like people with fetishes, but let me tell you, the people that have fetishes that comment on my videos are not subtle and they're not like nice. Like a lot of times they're very creepy about it. Like it's like, I know what you're trying to do is you're trying to get me to do something that fulfills your, fulfills your fetish need. That shit ain't free. So don't just stop. You're not being, you're not being sly. You're not, you're not hiding anything from anybody. I know what you're doing. That's the part that's creepy to me. Okay. I'm going to put a kibosh asking me if I'm doing a certain video. If you ask me, are you going to do a video on X? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. It is on a list. I have two years of video ideas outlined in my phone. It will happen eventually. I cannot promise it will happen at a certain time. I know about it. Trust me. It's in the phone. It's on the list. I have not forgotten. Mm, yeah, I've been looking for information on, okay, so this is like, I don't know if this is a continuation of the first thing. Uh, I've been looking for information about how much stress and pain a pregnant body can take without causing problems. In the past, I was a heavy impact bottom, but nowadays I'm not sure how much I can take. I mean, it sounds like a personal, like a personal thing. I, it sounds like a personal problem. That's not how I mean it, but like, it is like, it's individual, right? Like if you feel like you're not comfortable with that, then like, don't do it. But I'm pretty sure we talked about in that interview about like, it's about like, you know, you don't pick up a new workout routine when you get pregnant, but if you have an existing workout routine, you can like maintain that more or less. And the similar with like doing like impact play stuff, you know, outside of hitting certain areas of the body, right? Um, and also kind of navigating around things like your joints being looser, for example. Um, but like, if it's what you were already doing before, it's more or less fine, just dialed down like 10%. Depend, make sure you're doing it on like the appropriate parts of the body. The big thing you don't want to do is cause 
large sudden spikes of stress. That is bad for fetal development. We talked about that a lot in the video. I recommend you re-listen to it if you missed that part of it. Um, but yeah, we talked about stress and pain and like the main thing you need to worry about is where you're applying on the body and if your body is processing it as pleasurable, that's probably fine. If it's causing you to have huge strikes and huge spikes in stress, that's what you want to avoid doing. And you don't want to do stuff like, you don't want to suddenly introduce new types of like intense BDSM play, uh, you know, when you're, when you're pregnant that you didn't do before. But if it's something you did before, something your body is used to, and you know it doesn't cause you like big spikes in stress hormones, and you're not doing it on like your stomach, like probably you're going to be some degree of okay. You just have to calibrate it with like what you feel like, like your body is comfortable with. Um, and that's like what we talked about in the interview, obviously under the advisement of a gynecologist, under the advisement of your, of your, um, not entire gynecologist, of your obstetrician, like, under the advisement of, like, whoever it is as part of your care team that's helping you, like, through this pregnancy, like, that's pretty much what the video is about, and I do not imagine that somebody that is a pregnant bottom or had been pregnant and had bottom at the same time would have given any sort of different advice because the person, primarily topically, did also bottom as well. So I don't, I don't know what other information you could do <laughs> that, that could be covered that's not covered by that. Uh, it feels like it's a, a pretty concise answer, you know, accounting for the fact that it's, you have to give a general answer because I don't know you, I don't know your pregnancy, I don't know what your body is like, I don't know what play you were doing beforehand, I don't know what kind of play you want to do now, like, there's a lot of unknown questions in that that you're going to have to fill in for yourself. Um... Oh yeah, Baymax. I think I, I just picture Baymax when somebody says soft dom, not because of its caring nature, but because it's big and fluffy. Yeah, that that I can agree with. That I can agree with. Uh, what's your thoughts on ABDL getting absolutely memed on by anyone on social media? Uh, if it wasn't clear from the video I did on ABDL, I think it's shitty and I wish that people would not. It, it seems like really low hanging fruit and people are just like, let's make fun of these already ostracized group of people because they look so weird. It's like, what do you think you're doing? Not very nice. I don't think it's very nice. That's, that's my opinion. Um, I realized that was off the cuff, but totally what I was looking for. I am glad that that helped, Simon. Uh, yeah, it's like, it's easy to say, but it's also complicated at the same time. All right. All right. Uh, let's see. I have time for one more question and then I think that's going to be it for tonight, guys. Uh, how do you feel about playing music during a scene? Is there a type you like to use? Um, it depends on what scene I'm doing and the person I'm playing with. I personally really like music during scenes. I like wearing like noise canceling headphones and having like music like pumped in. Like I I really like having music during scenes. Some people are not into it. I really like it personally, but it depends on what scene I'm doing, right? So like I have different music for doing rope bondage versus doing uh, impact play versus doing role play stuff versus doing like there's so many different categories of music. Uh, I don't really know how to concisely say like what type of music I listen to. Like, it could literally be anything, right? It, it could be metal. It could be classical music. Uh, you know, it could be like modern, like, you know, kind of soft, like poppy music. It could be funk. It could be Anderson Peck. Like, I don't know. Like, it could literally be anything. It depends on like what I'm going for in the energy of the scene and choosing the music based off of that. Kind of feeling whatever, you know, is this going to be really like bonding and intimate, very like touchy feely? Is it going to be, um, you know, is there some kind, of, kind of role play flavor we're going with, you know, humiliation, fear or something, like what kind of music, you know, activates that, that kind of stuff. Uh, movie soundtracks can also be really good as well uh, because those do also go with, because like movie soundtracks are like designed to like evoke certain emotions 
when you're looking at certain things on screen. So that can be a really good tool as well, especially if you want to do stuff that's like suspenseful, suspen I'm going to say this correctly, I swear, suspenseful or like fear based, that kind of stuff, really, really good uh, stuff for that on uh, movie soundtracks. All right, thank you for taking my question. Super excited that you saw me. Thanks for your thoughts. Yes, I am super glad that you guys enjoyed this and we could uh, have a little conversation today, a little bit earlier than we normally do, but sometimes that's what happens. And yeah, so next Friday I will not be streaming because I will be doing the uh, Self Mayhem event. And again, you can get tickets for that until the 16th. So if you want to go and watch me teach and listen to my opening ceremony speech and all that fun stuff you can check that out because i'm going to be doing that mm. i'm going to be doing that instead of uh streaming uh next friday and yeah that's everything for today guys uh that's what we're doing next friday and i think that that's really it all right guys bye